<laughs> and because the statistics mean nothing in a real fight. That's that's somebody who took a bunch of fights and and probably fights that they were able to catch on camera or whatever, and then measured some some time frames and said, oh, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and I'm they like, also forget that, that average could could mean faster than average or slower than average on both sides of that. Exactly, exactly. And in, in, in the real world, it means nothing. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Hello, and thanks so much for checking out another episode of Uncensored Tactical. We have an awesome guest returning with us. We have Joel Riles from Fortress Canine. And I got two shout outs for Patreon, the ones that are uh, the producers of today's show, if you will. We got Nick W., thank you so much, and Neff again. Uh, been a long time fan. Thank you so much, Neff, for helping us out. And let's just jump right into the show topics, and maybe we'll do some housekeeping at the end. Uh, Joel, I'd like if you started with where people could find you, and then we did a quick intro for you. Sure thing. Um, they can find me on fortresscanine.com. That's F O R T. R E S S the letter K the number nine dot com or Canine Academy Online dot com and uh, we'll be talking about a little bit of both of those in more detail before too long and uh, and then I'm also on Facebook Instagram and YouTube and they can search Fortress Canine or Canine Academy Online on either of those platforms. Awesome and for the folks that maybe didn't catch your first episode, uh, you want to do a short intro to who you are. Sure. So I've been uh, training protection dogs for 17 years now and um, worked with another company for a number of years and then kind of branched off on our own. We train uh, personal protection dogs, family protection dogs, and executive protection dogs. And then uh, that's on our Fortress Canine side. And then then on the Canine Academy side, we run uh, public classes here in Orlando, Florida. So if you're anywhere in the Orlando area, you can physically come and train with us in person. Uh, and then we have an online training option that um, we're still expanding out and just continuing to add content to. Um, but it covers all of your basic obedience uh, all the way up to off lead obedience and then uh, some tracking, uh, service dog training, uh, tactical and protection dog training and uh, dynamic movement and things of that nature. So uh, we're continuing to build that out, but that's available for online training. Awesome. Uh, and we had some some listener questions and some other questions we didn't get to in our last episode that I wanted to jump into. Um, I see your outline here. Let me pull that up real quick. All right, so everyone, uh, I'm sure, is well aware that the economy is doing some crazy things with these current events going on. Um, I am really, really excited to buy from you later in the year, and a bunch of my buddies are also excited, too. Um, Let's get the the big question everyone wants to know out of the way. If you want to talk about some pricing options for what people can expect getting into owning a high-quality protection dog. Yeah, absolutely. So when we built Fortress Canine, uh, it started about seven or eight years ago, Mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out how we can make it possible for anybody who wants to own a protection dog to be able to do so. And so we kind of came up with a couple of different options. We sell on the Fortress side, we sell our trained dogs. And so for instance, like our, our, um, trained dogs, our personal protection dogs are the lowest level of fully trained dogs that we have. And they have, you know, your house training, your crate training, all their obedience. Uh, They've been trained to travel in a vehicle, to move with children and small pets. They're socialized, all that good stuff. And then they have the fight and bite training and the the basic protection work put into them. So those start at $30,000. And then the family protection dogs start to run some of the scenarios of attack on handler scenarios, fighting an armed attacker, vehicle attacks, home invasion and things of that nature, and they run 50000 And then our executive protection dogs um, get even more in-depth with counter-kidnapping scenarios, vehicle ambush, uh, deployments in a crowd. So if you're attacked while you're in, in a large crowd, uh, guarding an object, explosive detection, and deploying and recalling under fire. So, And those are 75000 So I understand that those can be big numbers for a lot of people. Um, the basic, the personal protection dogs, 
are about 12 to 14 months uh, of time and energy put into those and it goes up from there. And so there's, you know, a decent amount of people that have the money to be able to do that, but don't have the time mm-hmm. and, uh, and they can see the value in those dogs. And so that's, you know, that's what's available via the fortress canine side of the house. But then there's a lot of people who, you know, even if they tried to set up a, a year or two year payment plan, wouldn't be able to, to afford a $30,000 dog. Mm-hmm. And I can appreciate that as well. And so what we do is uh, from each litter, we, we breed all our own dogs. So we don't get dogs from outside sources. Um, that way we can control and maintain the quality of the dogs. We For a while, we're getting dogs from outside sources. And it just we, we had to reject so many dogs because of the poor quality and breeding practices of so many people out there. And um, but what we do with each litter is we choose about two or three dogs to go into the, the training program, and then the rest of the puppies are made available for sale. Um, and they're normally about two thousand dollars right now. They're fifteen hundred through the pandemic, um, and uh, so people can take advantage of that if they want to. But um, and then there were some people that were getting the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherds, and they were just concerned that they weren't going to put the right basic foundation into the dogs. So we started doing a basic obedience puppy package uh, that takes about two months. We do all of the, um, the crate training, the house training, we introduce their obedience. I wouldn't say they're fully obedience trained uh, in two months, just because our, at least by our standards, that's pretty much impossible, but, but it gets all of their, you know, the real kind of, that's their, time when you can mess them up if you will um and so it, it we kind of do that for you so that it can relieve some of that strain and stress um, from the person you know getting the dog and go okay well at least i know the basics are here the foundation is there i can just pick up and move forward and if they want to use the academy you know that gives them really good guidelines and, and follow through and so our untrained puppies are normally 2000 they're 1500 through the pandemic and our uh, trained puppies we call them um, are normally 5,000 and we're doing that for 4,000 during the pandemic. So that's kind of the, the basic outline of the, the dog specific offers that we have. Awesome. And I already have my next bullet point here was, um, to kind of give a walkthrough, like an example of what the distance learning would be or what your canine training Academy is like. Cause I, yes. I'm not a, I'm not a dog owner. Um, and I haven't been for a while, but so I don't understand how I would take what's on a screen and do that with my dog. So if you can walk us through some of that, how that would work, that'd be great. Absolutely. So there, there's a few lessons, uh, especially in the first module, um, and then kind of scattered throughout that are more informational. So you're, you're watching them and it's kind of like getting a, a classroom lecture okay. on, on whatever the topic is, but most I'd say, 80 to 85 percent uh, or maybe even more of the content is I'm I'm demonstrating on the field um, showing the people what the exercise is and then we're working multiple dogs sometimes it's one dog but quite often it's it's getting several dogs so you can see different reactions that the different dogs have to the um, to the exercise that we're doing mm-hmm. and then I'm talking through, here are common issues that people have, and here's how you resolve that issue. Um, oh, did you see what this dog just did? They just did this. This is why they're doing it. This is how you fix that problem when they do it. Here's the dog communicating. You see the communication that the dog is giving right here? Here's how we communicate back to the dog. So it's, it's a very step-by-step um, demonstrating the exercises Mm -hmm. and then you go out with your dog and if you have if you're watching it on an ipad or something like that you could literally be on your own little field in your backyard or whatever doing these exercises while you're watching the exercises and if you're doing this with our dogs our dogs are un they're they're like oddly consistent they're they're (laughs) like the way that they act it's it's there's not a lot of variation in terms of how they come into each exercise, right? And and there's sometimes when I'm working the exercise and I'm like, seriously, I promise you guys, this dog has never done this exercise before. Um, but these dogs just come in after two or three or four times of, of showing the dog the exercise. So um, it's not always that way for if you're doing your own dog or you're getting you know a dog from the pound or something like that. But when you're running through it with our dogs, I'm demonstrating with our dogs. So the uh, it's very, very similar from dog to dog. But 
it, it's designed so that you can either watch it in your house and then go right outside and do the exercise with your dog. Or you can literally take your iPad out and set it up and do the exercise and be pausing and playing and pausing and playing as you're doing the exercise directly with your dog. So it's, it's intended to be a very like hold your hand, walk through step by step methodology uh, of training. And, uh, and that's all through the first 12 modules. So originally the Canine Academy was a 12 module program. It was broadly designed to be uh, one module per month. And so you'd go through the first year with your dog and then you would um, have off lead obedience by the first year uh, of doing the training with your dog. The it's expanded out substantially from there. So now when you sign up uh, for the annual program, you get access to everything right off the bat. And you, um, you can click on the obedience and that is where all the 12 modules are contained. But now we have sections and, and some of these aren't filled out yet, but we're working on videos for all these sections and it's expanding out, um, right now, but we're offering uh, service dog training, uh, tracking training. So, uh, we ran an entire tracking course and filmed the whole thing and put that up there. Um, we do a lot of protection training. Uh, we're not getting into sp- specifically bite work just because of the liability somebody would inevitably stick their face down in front of the dog and get bit in the <laughs> face or something and then say it was my fault so we're, we're probably not going to put that specific portion in there but we have a lot of other information for protection dogs and then if they do a lot of that training they can come and and spend you know a four-day weekend with us a couple times a, y- a year and bring their dog out for protection work if they want to get to that level and uh, so it's that's how it's, it's built out and designed. And, um, and then we also have a private Facebook group that if you're in the Academy, you can, um, request to to join and you'll be accepted. And then if you have a problem, you can literally come and type it in there and say, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this exercise or this module or watching this video and I'm having this problem. What do I do? And, um, and then we, you know, I'll try and reply via text in that format. And then if I get two or three of those requests, or if it's one that I know, oh, yeah, that's going to be a common problem, um, then I make a video specific for that problem. That's fantastic. That's that's what a lot of big, big companies aren't really doing. And that's what I love this niche that we fill. I love the interaction. Yeah. I love when people send me the emails. Hey, I got this real specific question. Man, those that I'm thrilled to hear that you're doing that same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I really enjoy it. And the nice thing about doing it, via, I, I didn't want to do it in a text message format because A lot of times, you know, it takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes to type out the response based on, you know, I usually need to ask a couple questions and then I can can give some pretty good information on how to fix those problems. But if I am doing it via text message, I'm doing it over and over and over again, right? And and a lot of these questions are issues that people, lots of people are experiencing. So I wanted to put it into the Facebook group so that people could come and review back and look and see... um, you know, Hey, has anybody else had this problem? Oh yeah. He already answered that question. They can read through it. And then maybe they say, well, I, I got all that information that was really helpful, except my situation is slightly different like this. And, and then it, you know, it, it expands out something that stays there for reference. And then I can also go back and see, you know, I've gotten this question like three times. Um, we need to make a video for this. And, and we have what we call the problem solving library uh, in the Academy. And so you click on that and it's, it's my common questions that I get asked that we made videos specifically to address. Awesome, man. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm so thrilled. This is going to be so cool. Um, so for other, so back to the kind of the pricing again, that was just such a good segue to talk about how that course would work. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. So you buy a dog, you bring it home. So for people that are familiar with dogs, I'm sure it's not such a big transition, but for people that this might be their first dog, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you would prepare your house and prepare your car and then maybe some extra costs that might be involved with that? Yeah. So, you know, like with most things, you can, you can, you know, buy everything in the kitchen sink too, or you can kind of go budget, but that'll work. Right. Uh-huh. So if you're more on the budget side, the Great. minimum you need are um, a crate and, and in the Academy, we, we describe how to make sure your crate is properly fit to your dog. So if you're getting a puppy and the puppy's going to grow, you'll probably end up needing to buy two or three crates. Um, and But you can get the really cheap ones to start off with because they're not really strong. And then 
Um, I like the very kennel brand of crate because they're they're very reasonably priced. Even the largest are like eighty five dollars. Okay. What's the name and, brand for that? Uh, I'm gonna look it up. So it's it's very V A R I kennel. I think we might have talked and, about uh, that on our last episode. I can't remember. Yeah, and there's a couple of brands that you'll occasionally come across that are really similar to that. Okay. Um, but those are the ones that I like. They're they're pretty strong crate as far as the plastic crates go. Um, they they combine together with a, a metal bolt and then a uh, like a really heavy duty plastic um, kind of a wing nut that uh, that goes over the other side, and then they have the the standard wire metal uh, door on them and. If you now, if you try and take an adult dog that's never been in a crate and put them in there, and and they get anxiety from being trapped in a in a mm-hmm. crate, um, they'll break out of them. But if you do the crate training though, the way that we show you from the very beginning as a puppy and move them up, then I open my my crate doors and my dogs are like woohoo, like me time, and they run right inside their crates and chill out in the back and just hang out and and they like being in their crates. That's great. So. Um, so that's, you know, I always recommend to people, I'm like, do your crate training when your dog is very young, because you're going to take a tiny little puppy, you're going to bring it home, it's going to be in a new environment, it's not going to know you, it's not going to know your house, you're going to put it in a crate, and for the first three days, that dog is going to do nothing but go, arr, 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 in the crate. <laughs> and people will go, oh, the poor little puppy, I'm going to let it out. And I'm like, it's the worst thing you could do. Oh. Because, now, of course, you got to let the dog out to use the bathroom, and you got to let it out to feed it, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying you leave it in a crate for three days. But you do the crate training the way that it's described in the academy, and they will get over that fairly quickly. And then once they accept that their crate is a good place and that they're not going to have to go into it and be trapped there forever, because, you know, as a little puppy, I sometimes think that's what they think. They're like, oh, no, I'm trapped in this tiny little spot. I'm never getting out ever again. As soon as they realize, no, you come out and you eat. You come out to hang out with us. You come out to use the bathroom. You know, we let you out of this thing all the time. But you have to go in and be you know, calm and, and relaxed and chilled out in your crate. And as soon as they realize that they, they relax and then, um, you know, you just have to make sure you don't leave them in too long because puppies can only hold the bathroom for so long and things of that nature. And, um, and so coming back around to what you need, you need a crate mm-hmm. uh, and you need a crate that fits the dog. Cause if you get a big crate and put a tiny little dog in it, they'll go to one end and poop and pee and they'll go the other end and lay down. And, um, and so you kind of defeat one of the purposes of the crate, which is teaching the dog to go to the bathroom on a schedule and when you want it to, um, the other thing you're going to need, obviously is a couple of, uh, bowls for food and water. Um, you can go to Walmart and get the stainless steel. Like I, I think they're like five quart bowls or something like that. Three quart bowls are like a medium sized steel bowl and they're like four or five bucks a piece. Um, and then you want to get a decent dog food. I, I really, really like the Victor brand of dog food. That's what we use for all of our dogs. Um, we went through tons and tons of different kinds of dog foods, testing them out. And this one, um, for the way that it takes care of the dogs, it's not terribly expensive. It's about uh, 50 to $55 a bag if you get it on Chewy. Um, I think if you get two bags at a time, you, you get the free shipping rate. So, And you can set it up on like a a cycle where they deliver it to you um, every two, three, four weeks. You set how, how often you want to get it. And um, and then for one dog, like I, I go through, I have 12 dogs. Uh, on, on an average basis, I have about 12 dogs. And I go through uh, about four bags, four to four and a half bags a month. So if you have one dog, you know, you could set two bags and, and a bag would probably last you a month. Uh, with the dog. Now you're, again, the Academy kind of describes how we keep an eye on the dogs when they're growing. Um, they're going to go through growth spurts. And when they do, they're going to get skinny and you need to b- boost their food up. And then you'll notice, Hey, they're getting a little bit heavy uh, from getting too much food when that growth spurt stops. And then you'll back off just a little bit and you're going to be fluctuating their feeding amount a little bit as they're growing. And then once they get to eight to 12 months old, they stabilize out and you you pretty much don't need to do that anymore. I love that you mentioned that. I think on your most recent episode, you said something like a like a drill instructor can do something that's not nice to their student, but it's good for their or their cadet. It's good for their cadet. Yes. Uh, same thing with the dogs. You you have these people that think they're helping, and they say, "Oh, the poor dog. Let me feed it as much as I possibly can, and, and give it as much water as I can." And that's how these animals turn into these chunkers, right? So it is. And with the shepherding breeds, if you feed them too much, you risk, um, they call it bloat or twisted gut. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's one of the few things that even the well-bred shepherds are somewhat susceptible to 
is um, like, for instance, when we travel, we'll go, we typically fast our dogs the day before we travel. And then we travel and we feed them when we arrive on the other end. Um, but they'll sometimes go 24 hours without eating. Like they'll fast for a day basically. And, um, and so we get to the other end and, and some people have this tendency. They want to give them both days worth of feeding in one feeding. And, um, and you're really opening your dog up to having potential, um, issues. If you do that, you know, what you want to do is give them their normal feeding when you get there and then maybe, you know, give them two feedings split up by six or eight hours the next day, rather than trying to put down, you know, a double portion of food for them, uh, just to make sure you don't have an issue. The only time I've ever lost dogs, uh, to that was when they, they had a huge amount of food for one reason or another, and they overate and it caused that problem. So it's something to be aware of and the, to be cautious of. And then when you're talking supplies, so you got your food and water, you got your crate, and then you basically need, um, if you're going total bare bones, you need two other things, which is a prong collar, at least if you're going to follow the Canine Academy training model. Um, but you need some form of correction collar uh, if you're going to have a dog that is a working type of dog, and then you need a lead. Uh, so that's kind of your bare bones minimum, your food and water bowls, obviously dog food, a crate, a prong collar, and a lead. And you can do all that for probably 100 to 120 bucks. Um, and, and right off the bat, if you're not getting the full size crate, you could do it for probably 60 bucks. Um, now there's some, you know, I, I really like the Hermspringer model or brand of prong collar. Uh, it lasts longer. It doesn't rust and things like that nearly as much. So it costs a little bit more than the super cheap ones that you can get at PetSmart or one of those places. But, um, you know, that, that'll get your bare stuff. And then if you want to start adding on, um, I really like to have our dogs wear two collars. They wear a flat collar, uh, which is kind of your standard, either a webbing collar uh, or they make those biothane type collars now uh, that a lot of the hunting dogs use. And then I'm a vendor for Modern Icon, which makes a kind of like your high end collars. Uh, so those are in the between sixty and eighty dollar range. And um, but having a flat collar allows you, if you need to tie your dog out for a little while while they eat and drink in the morning, oh, wow, uh, it's a great nice. way for the yeah yeah. And it, it's a great way for the dogs to just be able to to kind of run around. Um, I typically use like a lightweight chain and, uh, and then we give them a dog house. So just in case it's raining or sunny or something, they can go inside of it, but it gives them their, you know, 45 to minutes to an hour of free time every day. And that way they're getting acclimated to the outside weather. Cause if you're going to work with your dog, you want them to be acclimated to whatever your conditions you're going to be working in. Um, uh, it's their time to eat and drink and use the bathroom. And other than the fact that they're, you know, they're, they're restricted to the area that they can go in with their chain. They're basically free to do what they want during that time frame. And, um, and if you're going to do something like that, you definitely want a flat collar for them. And, uh, and then we use it also for scent work and a bunch of other things, bite work and, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to get with you and make sure all these links are correct. And then I'll put all these in my article page for today. I'll, so that people know they can just go to the website and click the article and click the button if they're interested in these products or I'll just send them over awesome. to your website. Uh, you're a vendor for that. Do you do the sales through your site or how do you do that? Yeah. So the, um, the modern icon collars and harnesses are currently available on canine Academy online.com slash store. I'll put that link in. And, uh, yep. And, and you'll see in there so you can sign up for the canine Academy um, if you're local and training with us, that's where people can sign up for our subscriptions for training that saves them money if they train with us regularly. And then it also has uh, the leads that I make and all of the modern icon equipment that we carry. All right. What about um, what about kind of your monthly? So besides actual training, because we're definitely going to get into that. Um, what type of like dog maintenance could you expect to do? through the week or the month at home? So that will somewhat depend on where you live. So if you're mm -hmm. down here in Florida, like we are, um, any, any place that's kind of tropical or more, more moderately uh, climated, you're going to have more insect issues, right? So um, when I was in Wyoming at 9,000 feet elevation or Alaska, we pretty much didn't really have fleas and ticks. Uh, but obviously here in Florida, we do. That's a big issue. And if you're in a place where that is an issue, then I would recommend having some form of flea and tick control uh, personally, I like Brevecto. They are uh, you, you give them one dose every three months, and it's the only thing that I've found that actually lasts for three months. Wow. Um, 
all of the ones I was getting that were monthly about three weeks in, they were needing another dose. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to give a monthly (laughs) dose to my dog every three weeks. So Brevecto uh, is really good for that. And then, uh, and again, this will vary a little bit by location and and kind of what the problems are in your area. I don't like to over medicate if I don't need to, but um, parasite control is something that is important, especially heartworms. If you're in an area where that's a problem, and uh, so I use Interceptor Plus, and it's basically it, it's a parasite control. So it, it takes care of heartworms, but it also does kind of like an intestinal deworming, um, and it takes care of roundworms and hookworms and all of that kind of stuff. And that's a monthly thing. So I give that to them every month. And if you're going to do any kind of heartworm control, it's almost always every month because that's kind of like a uh, uh, early hatch hatch to adult cycle for for. A heartworm Mm -hmm. and the heartworm medication which is primarily ivermectin it kills the heartworm in a certain stage of their development but once they get beyond that it doesn't kill them anymore now they only live so long so if you miss a couple but you're you generally stay consistent with your application they'll get a few heartworms but then nothing else will grow to adulthood and then those will eventually die and, and you know disappear and dissolve so it's not the end of the world if you miss by a couple of days, but you really want to try and get consistent and stay consistent with your um, heartworm medication if you're in an area where heartworms are a problem. And uh, so that that's pretty much your only real monthly. I mean, obviously your dog food um, that you have to get uh, is there. And then depending on your dog and how OCD you are about cleanliness, um, you know, you might want to get some cleaning supplies. I always like to have a couple of rolls of toilet paper or a couple of old towels on hand. Um, if they, you know, go pee on the carpet or something like that, which, you know, no matter how well trained your dog is, you're going to screw up at some point <laughs> and your dog's either going to vomit because they're living, breathing creatures, right? They're not a robot. So they're either going to vomit, they're going to get diarrhea, uh, or they're, you're going to, you know, give them too much water to drink and not let them out to use the bathroom and they're going to pee somewhere. So, Just, you know, if you're going to have a pet, an animal creature living in the house with you, uh, unless you teach it to go into the bathroom and use the bathroom on the toilet, which I don't do, um, then at some point you're going to have that issue. So having some cleaning supplies kind of constantly on hand is good. Uh, I really like the Resolve brand of carpet cleaners. Um, Generally in my house, we don't have any carpet, but, you know, every once in a while there's an area rug or something like that that gets an accident on it. And um, I like to keep either towels or... um, paper towels on hand. I like to have some Febreze that kind of, you know, tones down uh, odor because, you know, unless you're going to wash your dogs all the time, they just will have a dogish smell to them. And, um, and that pretty much generally covers it. Uh, I use Dawn dishwashing detergent when I do wash my dogs. I don't do it a a huge amount because I don't like to take all the oil out of their fur. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I notice, like for some reason, we get into a place where the, the fleas are really bad or something like that, or I notice just some, a few ticks on them, um, and I want to get them cleaned up pretty quick, Dawn kills all that. So you lather them up, leave it on for about five minutes or so once they're completely covered and lathered up Dawn, and then rinse it all off of them, and all the, the bad little uh, insects will wash off with it. And um, But when you do that, it takes all the oil out of the fur, and if you do that consistently, their fur will kind of get brittle and start to crack and stuff. And uh, it's not as soft to pet either. So if you're into petting your dog like I am, you like it to be soft and and uh, nice to pet on. But that's pretty much the, the main things. In your vehicle, if you're bringing your dog with you in your vehicle a lot, uh, I like their – you can get them for like 15 or 20 bucks on Amazon. They're these um, – they're made out of like a, a lightweight Cordura material, nylon. Mm-hmm. And they have a loop on them, the hooks over the headrest and the back seats. And then it kind of – goes down and on, on the seat portion of the back seat. And then there's a portion that comes up behind the front seats and hooks over the headrests on them. So it makes kind of like this, like a taco, almost like a hammock, but it's sitting on the seat. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like a big uh, dog taco. Yes. Only they're free to move around in it, but it's nylon. So if they get dirty or they shed in there nice. or whatever, um, then you can just pull it out. You shake it off. You could even put it in the washing machine, I suppose. And, um, and it's, it's generally, it's not completely waterproof, but it's generally waterproof. So if they get car sick or something like that, it mm-hmm. really helps there too. Um, and it semi contains them. They can jump over it if they're kind of determined, but it, it kind of has this natural barrier um, between the two front seats. So if you don't want your dog running back and forth between the front seat and back seat, um, that can be really helpful as well. 
And then if you have leather seats or something like that, that you don't want all scratched up with their claws, it helps protect the seats as well. Fantastic. I don't have much to say on this one. This is great. These questions are rolling right along. Uh, I know you mentioned it a little bit before uh, on our last episode, uh, but one of my audience members had a specific question about how you handle your breeds and your breeding. Yes. So they ask they ask what breeds you have, and then they ask, um, I'm sure you know what, what's coming next. How do you phrase it for dog dog people? I forget, but you know what I'm about to ask, right? <laughs> Is um, the, 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 the history of the dogs, right? Yes, the lineage. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and then yeah, I usually somewhere in there get a question of what's the best breed to get. And uh, I'm always like, that's like saying, you know, what's, what's the best car to drive? Um, it really depends on what you want, right? But so for me with our breeding practices, um, and I, I try to really hard not to specifically just come out and bash people because there's a reason and a rationale behind what most people do, right? So, um, but we breed and we train working dogs to do a job. And that job could be to be a really obedient family pet for somebody, uh, or it could be to protect you when bad guys come and try to rape your wife and murder your children. So, and everything in between, right? So when I w- got into the work, the mentor that I had in the beginning utilized the, what he was taught by his mentor, which is the old breeding methodology. And that was the concept that every breed was created from other breeds. And because every breed was created from other breeds, if you're going to maintain that breed in a healthy and strong way, then you have to periodically reintroduce the original breeds into your breeding lines so that you don't get too genetically specific, which is basically inbreeding, right? And then when they would breed their dogs, they might have, you know, a German shepherd litter that just has this random Malinois in it. And so in a single litter, you could have, you know, six German shepherds and a Malinois. In fact, in my last Dutch shepherd litter, I had seven Dutch shepherds and a Malinois. And so they, they always called the dogs, whichever breed description they met. And that was how the original breed descriptions worked. So when they were creating the German shepherds breed, for instance, they created the breed description that they wanted this dog to be. And then when they would do a breeding, the dogs that met that breed description were called German shepherds. The ones that didn't were either you know, sent off as other things. Maybe they were Malinois or Dutch shepherds or whatever was used in that breeding. Um, or maybe they were culled. And I'm not necessarily a huge fan of that, but that was how the old breeding practices went. And so then they would take the dogs that they wanted to continue. And then they would have another line that they would be running simultaneously. And they would take the dogs that met the German shepherd breed description from there. And then those would be bred together as German shepherds. And for the most part, they would throw German shepherds. And so when you, when we started breeding, we would breed, for instance, a Malinois and a Dutch Shepherd together. And you would get a couple of Malinois and a couple of Dutch Shepherds. And when you have that, the Malinois are Malinois because that's the breed description that they meet. <laughs> and the Dutch Shepherds are Dutch Shepherds. And so even though they're full brother and sister, like I right now have a Malinois and a German Shepherd that are full brother and sister from the same litter, female German Shepherd and a little male Malinois. And they don't look like their brother and sister, but they're Ratchet's the father and Riley's the mother of that litter. And that's who they threw. Um, and then we had another litter that was 100% Malinois. Like they were all light colored red Malinois. And then uh, the very next litter with that same uh, pair, which was Apollo and Riley, um, they were all dark Malinois. They were all Malinois, but the first litter was all light and the second litter was all dark. And um, so you just kind of get these interesting things. What I'm interested in is not a look. And that's really where the AKC, I believe, went wrong is they wanted German Shepherds to look a specific way. What we look for is we want our dogs to have a certain uh, working quality to them that allows them to do the job that we created them for. So we specifically only deal with, this is us personally, Fortress Canine, is the German Shepherd, the Dutch Shepherd, and the Belgian Malinois. And recently we've actually started doing genetic testing when those came out. And, um, and so we, we've gone back and confirmed all of our old lines have only ever been German shepherds, Dutch shepherds, and Malinois crossbred at, at a certain kind of a breeding pattern that we do. And so 
that works out really, really well for us. And, you know, some people are like, I want a purebred. And I'm like, okay. Well, I mean, really, when you say I want a purebred, that's like saying, I, I want to get the child to adopt from, you know, my sister and brother getting together. And I'm like, if that's what you want, I mean, it's kind of weird to me, but that's basically what purebred means today. Now, it might have meant something, you know, previously, um, but today when you get a dog that's purebred, you're essentially getting a dog um, that genetically, and it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are brother and sister, but genetically, they're typically as close as brother and sister would be. That's that's interesting tying that to humans. I, I haven't really haven't really thought about that before, but I like your phrasing, which was every breed comes from other breeds. Yes. And a lot of people just don't think about that. And, you know, a lot of people get a dog because they like what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But every breed was created from other breeds, but every breed was also created for a specific purpose. So you have the retrievers. What do they do? They retrieve. It's typically for birds, right? You shoot a bird, the bird goes down, the dog goes and gets the bird and brings it back to you. You have pointers. They're also for bird hunting typically. And they they identify there's birds in that bush right there. And they, they stop and freeze so they don't spook the birds until the hunter's ready. And then they say right there, right there in that bush, that's where the birds are. And they point to it, right? And today you have pointers that don't point. Retrievers that don't retrieve, shepherds that can't herd, and yet people still want to call these things those breeds. And I'm like, they might look like that breed used to look like in some fashion, but if they don't point, they're not a pointer. And if they don't retrieve, they're not a retriever. And um, you know, and then people will get dogs like the pit bull or the Rottweiler or the blackmouth cur dogs, and they like the look of them, which I don't, you know, I don't dislike the look of them. I think they're kind of cool looking dogs, but they are in the class called the mauler class and so the, when people say oh they were mauled by a dog the reason that term came about is because there is a a breed type of dog like a retriever or a pointer called the mauler and the mauler's jobs were to catch game and hold it for the hunters to come in and spear and uh so you would hunt things like pigs and uh things of that nature uh sometimes lions and bears they would use these dogs on and their job was to grab a hold and pull. And when you had four or five or six of them on an animal, all grabbing and pulling in opposite directions, it basically traps the animal in between the dogs. And then the hunters can come in and spear the animal and, and kill it. Well, if you take a dog like that and it's still got that mauling instinct and then something sets it off when they bite, it's really bad. So that's why a lot of your pit bull bites and things like that look so bad. Um, in all reality, they probably don't really happen that much in terms of percentages of pit bulls out there to numbers of times people get bit by them. But when they do bite, it's really bad. Whereas, you know, chihuahuas bite people way more often than pit bulls do. But when they bite you, it's a little, you know, a little <laughs> nip and a bruise and you go, hey, knock that off. And uh, so, you know, it's just the level of damage that's caused when something does go wrong. Um, but if you want a dog for hunting, then those are awesome dogs. If you want a dog for retrieving, shepherds aren't the dog you get. You know, if you want a dog for pointing, you don't go find a Belgian Malinois. But if you want a dog for protection and a dog that can do a lot of different things really well, maybe not as good as a dog specific to that, that uh, exercise, then the German shepherds, Dutch shepherds, and Bel Belgian Malinois make a really good uh, choice for that, which is why so many law enforcement and military choose those breeds. Yeah, my brain's overflowing. This is, I'm loving this. Let's do uh, another listener question here. Um, so when would a dog, and I think you answered it on your last podcast too, and we'll, we'll plug that at the end. I'm, I've, I've been trying to steer a lot of people there. Um, when does a dog protect based on instinct and, and when would that be the right thing to do? And when do they protect based on a specific command? Can you walk us through those two different um, environments? Yeah. So a lot of times I'll, I'll have clients that have a German Shepherd, right? And since they see all my German Shepherds, uh, quite a few of my clients have that type of dog. And so, you know, and they'll see us doing protection work or somebody, one of my other clients that do protection work with us will say, you know, oh, you should come to the protection class. And they go, oh, no, I'm good. My dog's very protective, right? And they'll, they'll say that, you know, oh, well, they bark when people come to the door or they growl if somebody walks in my house. And it's important for people to understand that is what I call posturing. So, and, and dogs will do this to one another and dogs will do this to people. And so there's a, 
a massive difference between posturing and actually protecting. So what posturing is, is something will happen that the dog doesn't like. So maybe it's a person comes into their house and they get that, you know, that vibe, whether they're detecting, you know, elevated levels of adrenaline or whatever it is that dogs detect that they can tell hmm, this person has some aggression in them and they start growling and barking. Now, maybe, right, because that's a deterrent. So posturing is a deterrent. That's actually why the dog does it. They're trying to keep you from messing with them. They're saying, stay back, leave me alone. I don't like you. And, um, and so they posture and maybe the person goes, oh, there's a dog. They're growling at me. I don't want any part of that. I'm going to leave. But don't mistake that for a dog being willing to enter a fight with a pinnacle predator. And so just because your dog is protective and, and they can sometimes do this as early as like eight weeks. I've seen eight week old puppies posture on people and I've seen, you know, two, three year old dogs uh, do it and, and they didn't do it before. So d- different dogs will start that at different levels. But when it comes to actually protecting our, our philosophy on it is, and there's a, there, this is one of the areas where we're kind of controversial in the industry is I don't want my dog to bite somebody and hold on. Um, That would be like me telling you, hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to teach you self-defense. And when that guy with that knife right there comes toward you, what I want you to do is hug him and squeeze really tight. And you're like, "Uh, well, how's that going to work? It's like, don't worry. You'll be safe. Just do it. (laughs) And, And if he starts stabbing you, just squeeze him tighter. You'll be okay. Right, and I don't know if you saw my uh, my Instagram story. It's it's come up a couple times in my thread. Um, there was recently a, a dog that was stabbed, I think, thirteen times. Oh. It was a, a police dog, and the pictures are in the um, like the operating room, I guess, of a vet. And the handlers there trying to you know uh, put pressure on on stab wounds and things like that while they're trying to save this dog. Uh, I haven't heard whether they were able to or not, but that is a situation where the the sporting world says a dog should bite and then hold on and not let go no matter what. So you'll see videos of dogs biting and then they're whacking them with sticks or they're doing various different things and they just want them to stay holding on, right? Sometimes they'll pick them up off the ground. They'll lay down and roll around with them and they just want them to hold on to that sleeve that they're biting and not let go. Well, there is an application there for an apprehension dog. So the whole purpose of a police dog typically is to help the officer apprehend the bad guy, catch him, put him in handcuffs, take him to jail. But we don't train apprehension dogs. We don't train police dogs. We train protection dogs. And if you want a dog to protect you, then that dog needs to be ready for several different types of scenarios. Uh, Me and you, if somebody attacked us, we're probably fighting back right? Mm-hmm. It, and we have our dog with us and our dog engages and we're still fighting. Like we're fighting right alongside our dog. You got that arm. I'm going to be trapping this arm, taking him to ground, kicking him in the head, doing whatever it is we're going to do. If I had a 90 pound female getting a protection dog, I do not recommend that a 90 pound female comes in and engages with a threat, right? Or how about this one? And this would apply to me and you too, if we mm-hmm. had children that we were moving with. And somebody threatens you and you have to use your dog to protect yourself. Are you going to leave your kids standing there in the parking lot while you go in and hands on with this guy? That's probably not the wisest decision, right? Probably. And of course, every situation is unique, but probably getting my children to safety first is my primary and then figuring out what to do next after that. So we train our dogs to fight alongside of us. We train our dogs to fight on their own. We train our dogs to go to the threat and and take it out because there's certain situations where that might be appropriate. And we train our dogs to recall from a distance. So I shouldn't have to go to the fight that's happening. Like, let's say I deployed my dog on somebody who was trying to rob me in a, in a parking lot and I have my kids with me. So I grab my kids and I say, let's get to the car. And we run to the car and we throw everybody in the vehicle and I jump in the vehicle and crank it up and I back out. Now I can roll my window down and go out let's go let's go let's go and the dog comes running in jump in the vehicle hop up and they jump in the vehicle through the window the open window and we take off right and then we can call the cops or do whatever it is we're supposed to do from a safe location where we're not standing there potentially dealing with a threat when i have my children that i have to worry about or the same thing uh, with a mother you know going grocery shopping with her kids while her husband's at work or whatever is the situation going on right there's a million and one different times and a lot of people 
plan their entire defensive scenario around, oh, well, it's just me. And, and in this situation, I'm going to X. And I'm like, well, that works when it's just you. But what about when you're out with your girlfriend? If three dudes attack you and you're out with your girlfriend, two of them focus on you and the other dude grabs her and drags her away. That probably wasn't the best thing to do. And, um, and so that's kind of the approach that we take uh, with the dogs. So um, when it comes to, you know, protective versus, um, you know, only biting on command, basically, you know, my recommendation is if you're going to rely on your dog to be a protection dog, make sure it's trained to deal with that level of stress. And then when we train our dogs, the only time they're allowed to bite without a command mm -hmm. is when the handler is physically attacked. So we'll do scenarios where people are acting really stupid and in, in our scenarios, they're doing things that we would never allow to happen yeah. within that closer range to us in real life. But if you know that you can do it in that scenario, then you know when people do whatever they're actually going to do in real life, you're good. So we do a lot of scenarios which are essentially the equivalent of bite, no bite scenarios, kind of like the shoot, no shoot scenarios that we do in military and law enforcement. Uh -huh. And um, so we'll do a lot of those drills with the dogs and the dogs are not to attack unless one of two things happens. They're told to or their handler actually gets attacked. And, um, and so that's kind of our approach to it. The only time the dog can do what we call break obedience. So when my dog is with me, they're always in some form of obedience. They're what we call a foos walking at my side. Maybe I tell them to leave it. That's a command. It's an obedience command to not go and, and mess with whatever that thing is that I told them to leave. Um, they might be in a sit beside me or a lay down beside me. And the only time they're allowed to break that obedience is if I get attacked. And, you know, there may be a scenario where there's a guy in front of me, I'm giving all my focus to him, but I didn't realize his buddy sneaks up behind us and grabs me. Well, then my dog doesn't need a command. Um, because the reality is most people wouldn't give a command in that situation anyway. Because people ask me all the time when I'm doing deliveries. So what should I say to my dog when you attack me? And I go, well, what you should say to your dog is take him out. And then you should take control of the situation. But what you're actually going to do is scream like a little bitch. And they're like, no, man, I'm not going to do that. And then guess what happens? They scream like a little bitch because they're caught off guard. Because I say, so when you round that corner, I'm going to attack you. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and then they're approaching the corner, so 15 yards away or whatever, and I jump out of the bushes and attack them. And they're like, but you said you were going to attack me over there. And I said, you're never going to attack me. You think you're going to get attacked. You always get attacked somewhere else. And uh, But what do they do when they get attacked? They scream like little bitches. Because that's what we all do if you get totally taken off guard. The first thing in your mind isn't, I'm going to say the perfect command to my dog so that we can react to this. No, you just have to react. And... So that's why we allow the dogs in that specific situation, their handlers attack, they just react. They, they can immediately come into the bite. Everything else is under, under control. What's the difference between planning and experience? When you plan, it could sound great to go, well, okay, well, when you're getting attacked, take out your taser and say, taser, 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 and then pull the trigger. Exactly. Except and you're a little busy in real life. You might not have that time. Exactly. Everything is time and opportunity, right? Like if you have the time and opportunity to, to take your dog off their prong collar and put them on their flat collar when somebody's getting ready to attack you, hey, that's great. You know, maybe the situation carries on long enough that you can just, you know, real nonchalantly reach down and unclip from their prong and clip into their flat collar or something like that. And if, if you have that ability, that's wonderful. But 99% of the time, you, it will never even cross your mind. It's, it's why the complex um, de decocking or safety uh, levers on firearms are not popular with people who use them in real stress situations because unless you train all the time with it, you forget to take your safety off in the, in the moment. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, I had a guy uh, respond to a video I posted of Ratchet. This is probably like six months ago or maybe more now. And, uh, and we were introducing using a block to the dog. So the person has something in their hands, a chair, a bucket, something that they can keep the dog away from them with. And they're trying to keep the dog from coming in and biting them. And the, this guy responded and said something to the effect of, well, you only have 8.3 seconds to do this and, and 12 seconds to do that and 2.6 seconds to do this. And I'm like, oh, so you're a guy who's read about fighting, but has never actually been. Before. <laughs> and because the statistics mean nothing in a real fight, that's, that's somebody who took a bunch of fights and, and probably fights that they were able to catch on camera or whatever, and then measured some, some time frames and said, oh, X, Y, and Z. 
Yeah, and I'm I like, also forget that, that average could could mean faster than average or slower than average on both sides of that. Exactly, exactly. And in, in, in the real world, it means nothing. So what means something in the real world is that you read the situation and you react accordingly to the situation. And the only way you can train yourself to do that well is to train under high levels of stress frequently so that you have a stress inoculation level that allows you to, to reason. Whereas most people that um, have never been in those situations it happens and they go into you know the fight or flight animalistic reactionary type response and if they've planned in their mind to run lots of scenarios in their mind for that specific response then maybe it works out for them but if, it, if the situation deviates from that and they're incapable of, of recognizing the deviation and adjusting for it then it usually goes really bad and um and it's, it's very fascinating to watch people who have done it, uh, who have gone through stress inoculation training, and then who haven't. And um, it, it's I, I've just been really fascinated doing bite work with a lot of different people and running scenarios. And when the person starts fighting back and they're not doing the, ah, ah, I'm being bit by the dog, I give up, you know, and they start actually fighting back, they'll start yelling a command and they'll just keep yelling that command even when it makes no sense, <laughs> right? And, uh, and they'll do it for 15 or 20 seconds. And by then the fight's over, you know, and uh, whereas the, I watch other people who have done the stress inoculation training and they'll do one thing and then immediately they'll change to something else and immediately they change to something else and immediately they change to something else and finally take the guy down and get him under control. And in their mind, that was a five minute fight because they were like, oh, why isn't this thing working? Hmm. Well, this guy's bigger than me. And so this thing isn't working. I should switch to something else. And all that happened in your mind in like a minute. But in reality, it happened in like a second and a half. And uh and so, and those are the people who have done the stress inoculation training, the adrenaline hits their mind and they're able to think at an accelerated pace. And so it feels like everything's going in slow motion. And, um, so it's fascinating. I actually am, am doing a, one of my next podcast uh, topics is the physiological and cognitive responses to stress. And, uh, so that's why it's kind of on the top of my mind. So, so that was my long winded response to the difference between protective dogs and, uh, and being trained to respond to specific things. How about a cool down topic? Now that my brain's in combat mode, I'm kind of I know, right? <laughs> take a sip of my drink here. Um, so more on. Let's talk a little bit more about dogs and other animals in the home. So whether that would be like a dog and a cat, or a protection dog and a non-protection dog, uh, or dogs and kids. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on some of those things? So you you definitely want to make sure that your protection dog, if you're going to have one, is um, is good with the other animals. So we train our dogs specifically for that. Um, and there's aspects of the, the leave it command and things like that in the academy that help the clients to do that if they're doing their own training with a puppy. Um, so like, for instance, I just placed a dog in Texas about four months ago. And she was kind of like, a, like she's an animal lover. So she has like four cats. And, the, and all her animals were previously rescues before she bought a dog for me. So she's got like four cats and like four little tiny dogs that are like 10 pounds or less. And, you know, I'm talking like Jack Russell type little, you know, spitfire dogs that are like full of energy and like ah, everywhere. And, um, and so she was like, Hey, you know, is, is this new dog that I'm buying from you a train protection Malinois is it's going to be safe around my dogs. And, I say, yes, he's been trained to, to be around that kind of stuff and to leave it alone, but you also have to be fair to the dog, right? So uh, if you have a cat that just runs into the room and attacks a dog, you, it's unfair to expect your dog to just sit there and be attacked by a cat every time it walks across the room. Now, cats don't typically do that, but if that happened, you would want to do something to get the cat to stop doing that inappropriate behavior. If your dog is behaving and the cat attacks your dog, you need to be fair and reasonable to your dog. One that's more more realistic and happens more frequently is these little dogs will sometimes um, kind of get real yippy or right in the dog's face and, and they're kind of jumping up on them. Sometimes they're biting their tails or their ears or things like that. In those situations, I go, you don't really have to get that dog fully into obedience necessarily. I, I encourage it, but I'm like, re in reality, most of the people, like they didn't train that dog in the first place and they're not really interested in doing it now. But what you do have to do is be fair to the big dog or be fair to the protection dog because sometimes the other dogs are their size. And at the very least, those dogs have to behave enough around the trained dog that they're not 
going to cause them harm. They're not being unfair to them. Um, you know, meaning they're not just constantly pestering them and things like that. And, uh, and so there's different ways that we introduce that with, um, with the delivery in Texas that we did. What we did was we set up a, um, a little barrier in the kitchen and the little dogs were used to being in the kitchen. And then one at a time they were brought over to get used to the big dog. And, and then it was after they were good on an individual basis and we'd bring two of them over in various different, you know, groups. And, um, and then eventually, uh, he would just lay in the kitchen and they were like, Oh, okay. Yeah. He's like one of us now. So, you know, it was a little bit of an introduction period. Um, he sleeps on the bed with her. She specifically wanted him to do that. Mm -hmm. And she's got two cats that sleep on the bed. And so we started with one cat on the bed and he got used to that cat and the cat was like, Oh, okay. You know, this big dog. And it was the more mellow of the two. And then the other one kind of like, you know, threw his nose up at him and was like, well, if he's in the room, then I'm not going to be there. And that lasted all of about maybe three or four weeks. And then all of a sudden the cat's coming in and he's like, well, but I thought if I didn't come in, like you kick him out or something, whatever cats think in their brains. And, uh, and eventually the cat jumped up on the bed and then she sent me a picture of them both snuggled up together on the bed sleeping. Right. And so usually the problem is not our dogs. It's the other dogs or cats and making sure that they're not doing something that's provoking the dog to defend himself or herself. Wonderful. But we've, we've ne just never had problems with that. All of our clients that have had other dogs or cats, um, they've always integrated in really well. Uh, I think we briefly talked about it on the last show, but we can do another touch up. So how long is reasonable to leave a dog in a crate or a home unattended? And um, do you leave the dog in the crate when you go to work in the morning if, if the house is empty? Or do you leave them in a room or a free room? Can you give us some thoughts on that? So what we do is I don't trust the dogs to just be totally loose in the house until they're about two, two and a half years old. And I do what I call, I give freedom really slowly and I take it away really fast. So if I was going to leave my dog in the house loose while I went to work, which I could do with ratchet at this point, um, is I kind of give them some test runs. So I go, I'm going to the store. I'm going to be gone for about 20, 30 minutes. If I come back and you've messed anything up, you're going back in the crate. And, uh, and then, but if they do a good job there, then I'll do that a couple of times. And then I'll go, Hey, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to be gone for an hour and I'm going to see how you do. And if they, at any point, you know, if I come back and they've been naughty, then, um, then they go in their crate and they realize they know it, right. They know that they, they're not loose in the house now because I messed up last time, especially if you come in and you fuss at them about it. And, um, so in terms of how long they can be in a crate, um, our dogs sleep in the crates at night. So they go to bed. Uh, they go into the crates when we go to bed and they come out in the morning. And uh, I usually do a routine where I get up, I get coffee, uh, kind of check my emails and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And then I let the dogs out because I don't want them to think as soon as they hear movement in the house, it's time for all of them to get out. That's great. Um, and so, you know, and I, I tell my people, like, don't, unless your, your schedule is benefited by it, don't just wake up and let the dog out every time. Because if you do that, then you have to wake up and let the dog out every time because they're going to get conditioned to, as soon as I hear you move, that means I get to go to the bathroom. And it's like, have you ever been on a road trip where you're driving? And you're like, hey, I kind of have to use the bathroom, but I can go one more exit. Yeah. It's, it's like, And then like 30 minutes later, right? You're like, man, I really got to go, but that's not a good exit. And then by the time you get to where you're pulling off and you've gone for like almost an hour now without using the bathroom when you after you felt like you had to go. And the minute you start to get off that exit, you're about to wet your pants Yep. because mentally you're like, okay, here it is. This is it. I'm going to get to use the bathroom now. And it's like, there's something about that trigger in our mind where it's like, I couldn't hold it now for more than five minutes if I had to, like I have to pull into that gas station and run inside and use the bathroom. And, um, well the dogs get the same way when they get conditioned to a certain thing. Right. So that's why I don't want them to be conditioned to I stumble out half seeing anything in the morning and I'm just trying to get coffee made. And now I got to start taking these dogs out. So I want them to know, hey, I'm going to get up. I'm going to start moving around. That doesn't mean you're going to use the bathroom yet. You're going to use the bathroom after I'm done with these things. Then I'm going to start coming and getting you guys and letting you use the bathroom. And um, so the longest I've ever had dogs in a crate was when I was driving cross country and I had 12 dogs in my 12 passenger van all in crates. And it was like a th four day drive. And so we went 48 hours at a time in the crates. So we did a stop halfway through. 
um, cause I was pretty much driving straight through that time. I would stop for like two hours of sleep and then go. And, uh, so, and none of my adult dogs had an accident in the crates during that time. I would not do that on any kind of regular basis, but in an emergency, um, that's how long I've had them go in crates and, and be okay. You did bathroom breaks on the drive, right? We did one, two days in. Damn. So we went two days and then we stopped and let everybody, because it, it was literally a four hour process to let all the dogs out. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. And uh, so if I'm trying to travel cross country and I'm trying to get from point A to point B, I can't have a, a you know, a eighth of a day <laughs> stop every day. Um, it's going to make a, a four day trip, a seven day trip. So it was, uh, it was feed and water everybody really good and then give them about a 12 hour fast before the trip and then load up and go, 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 go. I would give them like a little sip of water um, each day just to make sure they were good. But dogs don't sweat like we do. So they don't have a, uh, if they're in a, like a climate controlled space and they're just laying there doing nothing, they can go for, you know, a day with just a little bit of water. And um, so we, you know, it was air conditioned and all that good stuff. And then when we got to that, that halfway point, it was like, let everybody out. They were out for four hours or so running and stretching their legs and having fun with each other. And then everybody ate and everybody drank and they got like another hour after that to make sure they could all had a chance to use the bathroom. And then the whole process of loading back up, which was the way that the crates were stacked was I had to like load a certain set of them and then load the next set of crates in and then load the dogs and load the next set of crates and load the dogs in. So it was just this really big ordeal. Uh, again, I would not recommend doing that if you don't absolutely have to. It was just a, I was in a unique situation where I had taken 12 dogs with me on a security job that we were doing, and that was my requirement. I'll do the job if I can bring all my dogs. And uh, But it required me to drive from Northern California to Florida. Dang. <laughs> so, again, it, so you know, going to work for the day, um, going to bed at night, you're fine as long as you make sure that the dogs don't like eat and drink a bunch and then go right into the crates. Uh, you're probably going to come home to a mess in the crate if you do that. And if they're really young, you know, you may want to see if you have a friend that can come halfway through the day and let the dog out just to make sure that it you know, doesn't have an issue. Um, the puppies are usually, you know, by the time they're about 12 weeks old, they're usually good going through the night. Um, but, you know, the older the dog gets, the longer it's able to hold it. And as long as you're being active and doing stuff with the dog when you're um, when you're with them, then, you know, being in the crate while you're at work and while you're sleeping is, is generally not a big deal. Cool. Similar question. We're talking about the house and we're talking about some limitations here, uh, for people that don't have access to a huge training ground and might not even have a house with a backyard. Uh, how are people going to keep a canine engaged in something like say a small apartment? Absolutely. So number one, our dogs, unless they're on a tie out eating, um, our dogs are always in obedience. So like, I don't have my dogs roaming the house. Um, my dogs go to the place, they lay down, they wait for the next command. So if I'm doing admin work that day, then my dogs are doing a lot of laying around the house that day. Um, if it's a training day and we're going out to the field, then we're going out and they're going to get lots of fun work on all the obstacles and everything. But the, the best thing to do with your dog is to have discipline. Uh, it requires you to have a certain level of discipline and then you to expect discipline from the dog. So if I say lay in that spot, then you expect that they're going to go and they're going to lay in that spot. And that alone, that level of discipline has a certain level of engagement in the dog's mind uh, that's really good for them. But you don't want to do just that, right? Because they'll just, anybody would get stir crazy just laying in a house all day and just going out to use the bathroom and eat and come right back in and lay in the house. So it's good to take them on walks. Um, when you, you know, you should do that probably once a day or so just to let them move their legs and everything. And then as you're walking around, there's almost always what we would refer to as natural obstacles. And so you're walking along and there's a bench, right? Like a, just one of those like bus stop benches or whatever. And, uh, you tell the dog hop on the bench. So they jump up on the bench and sit and they sit down, good sit, walk around the bench a couple times, plus lay down and they lay down, maybe walk around the bench a couple times. And then tell them, all right, good plots, you know, let's go. And then they hop off the bench and they start walking with you again. And as you come across things like that, you and you, you, if you change it up, it constantly is engaging the dog's mind, right? So, yeah, we walked by that bench yesterday and you jumped up on it, but we're not jumping on that today. We're going to do something different, right? Like maybe I'm going to have you go under the bench and crawl back and forth underneath the bench or crawl under it once and then jump over it the next time. So even with just something as simple as a bench, 
there's like five or six different things that you can do. And in the academy, when you start seeing the different uh, basic agility drills that we do, you can do that with a bench, you know, and um, or you could do it, you know, if there's an elevated wall around in a park or something like that uh, alongside a uh, sidewalk, have the dog jump up on the wall and walk across the wall. Uh, coming back to that lady in Texas uh, that just got her dog, she started sending me all these pictures. She would go to um, these different parks in the area that she was in. And and the entrance of the parks, they would have these these big rocks all kind of stacked up. And sometimes they would have like the name of the park engraved in them and stuff. And she would have her dog jump up onto these rocks and then pose for pictures for her. And, uh, and he got to the point where he just loved it. He'd get out somewhere and he'd see the big rocks and he'd be looking at her like, am I going to get to jump up on those? And, uh, and so she'd jump him up there and she'd take a picture and she'd send it to me and be like, Hey, look, we're at this park today. And, um, so there's, there's things like that, that you can do. Um, you know, a lot of people will say things like Malinois need to run every day. And I'm like that, you know, this is why people have these, like these crazy things, like these, uh, treadmills for dogs and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, that. All that's going to do is either give the dog joint issues from from um, repetitive injuries or you're going to have a dog that runs a marathon every day because Malinois are like the pinnacle athlete. If you run them four miles today in a week or so, four miles isn't going to wear them out anymore. Now you're going to have to run them six miles and now you're going to have to run them eight or ten miles. And to me, I've always just looked at that as unless you're a runner and you just want to run with your dog, that's great. Go run with your dog. But don't expect that going and running with your dog is the, the thing that's going to engage their minds because after they get used to that distance and that pace, that's not going to be a big deal for them anymore. And, um, and so I always say just the dog integrates into your life, whatever your life is like. And so if, if you, you know, what I encourage people to take the dogs everywhere that they can when they go around so that the dog's not just in the house all the time. But, you know, if your life consists of coming home from work and getting changed and going to the grocery store, then take your dog to the grocery store if at all possible or take them to Lowe's or take them to something like that. So they get out, they get in the vehicle, they ride, they see new things, they get exposed to new experiences and then they come back home with you. And if you have a protection dog, then, you know, your dog can't protect you in a parking lot if they're not with you in the parking lot. They're back at home that you know that kind of defeats the purpose of having the dog that was good all right um i have two more questions i think they're pretty easy ones for you okay so if you want to talk about it how do you do the naming for your dogs so usually our children help us Uh and i'll either pick a theme or the children will pick a theme now that i'm doing a lot more um public classes Sometimes my clients will just say something and it will like give me an idea and I'll be like, that's the theme for our next letter. Um, something sparked it the other day. I think we were actually finishing up the Vikings television show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, the next letter that we have, it's going to be the – initially it was going to be the Norse gods, but I was I expanded it out to be the, any of the mythical gods. So I was like, all right, so this is going to be all mythical gods and goddesses. And so that's how we ended up with Ares and Fenrir and Erebus and Athena and Venus and Nemesis. These are all the the Greek and Norse uh, gods, right? And goddesses. So that's typically what we do. And then we used to, people used to ask us a lot, you know, well, can I change the name and blah, blah. And so we used to do that. Now what we do because it helps us track our litters is I say, listen, when you get your dog, you can call him anything you want. I don't care. But officially on paper this is this dog's name because i know that this litter was all the mythical gods and goddesses so if you call me up and you say this is you know my dog that i'm having this issue with i know who we're talking about and i know who the parents were and i know all of that and it it helps me uh kind of keep everything synced up um because most of my litters and my breeding and all that kind of stuff is all just in my head. So I'm always like, yeah, that, that those two are related, so they can't breathe, but those two are good. They can breed. And people are like, how do you know this? I'm like, well, it's just all here in my head. Like, I don't have this massive breeding program. I, I only have six or eight dogs at a time that are, that are breeders. And, uh, and then they might have three or four litters each and then, you know, they move on. So it's not terribly difficult, but 
if uh, I start letting people name the dogs anything they want, it gets confusing. Got it. And our last listener question, and then we can open up the floor and do anything else that you, uh, you have left for us. Last listener question. They were concerned, more of a concern than a question, concerned that your dogs are all getting the proper boop on their snoot throughout the day. So our dogs get lots of loving. In fact, while we're talking, I'm sitting here rubbing Ratchet's ears uh, with my thumb on the inside of his ear and my fingers on the outside. And he just like almost passes out as I do it. So um, apparently that's a thing that you do on Instagram and stuff (laughs) like that. Um, what my dogs love is I put my fingers um, on their snout right behind their nose and I just slowly rub up between their eyes and then back down. And uh, so they really, really like that. They love the, having the insides of their ears rubbed real gently where you kind of put your thumb down inside their ear just a little bit and then rub up to the tip of the ear. Um, and then the other two places that they really seem to like uh, is um, scratches behind the ears, of course. And then we call it like pet my butt is uh, getting a scratch right at the base of their tail on top of their their back, right back at the base of their tail. Um, They really like that. We don't do a lot of petting under their bellies and their chest um, unless we're doing scent work because that's their reward for finding things. So if they're tracking or if they're finding explosives or something like that, um, we reward them by by giving them a bunch of rubbing and loving by petting their chest and their belly. And uh, so they don't get that on a regular basis, but they get lots of other loving. Wonderful. That was that's all I got for you. So, anything you wanted to add that was maybe important that you wanted to leave out or leave out, add in? <laughs> Jeez, I'm a mess. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I think just uh, like we could let people know if they want some more information and some more deep dives into certain specific topics. Um, that's kind of why I created the podcast. Yes. Because uh, on my videos, you, know, you typically have to sit down and watch a video on your on a screen, um, but when you're in a podcast mode you can be driving and doing other things so that's why I, I started doing that so maybe just letting people know you know there's some some places you can go to get a little bit more deep dive into some of this stuff um and, and, and the, the, the podcast? videos are available it's protection dog podcast so it is not the protection dog podcast because that always drives me crazy when i have to put a the in front of something um so i just did protection dog podcast got it and i've listened i think you got seven or eight episodes up now yeah, there's actually 10 uploaded, but they, they're scheduled every Thursday. So every Thursday morning, they go live on all the different platforms. Got it. I'm glad that we covered that because I've been listening. I've, I'm caught up on all of them, and they're fantastic. Awesome. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Because sometimes I do them, and I'm like, hmm, like I don't know how applicable that was. And I love the ones I do, though, where I'm talking, and I get to like the 20-minute the mark, and I'm like, now for the question everyone's been asking. What the hell does this have to do with training dogs? And then we get into like why it's important for actual dog training and handling. And uh, it's, you know, we get into like anger issues. I don't know if that one's gone live yet or not, but I I just did one on uh, anger and uh, how anger is a good emotion for showing us that something is wrong, but it's a really bad emotion for solving whatever it is that's wrong. And um, so we we need to first understand anger and then have a proper uh, response to it so that we're not trying to use it to solve our problems. But then we get to the, you know, 20 minute mark or whatever. And it's like, and what the hell does this have to do with training dogs? And, uh, and then we get into that. So that's always kind of one of my fun aspects. Yeah. Number seven was the last one I heard, uh, canine stability. And that was certainly you in your stride talking about something that's really important. I was really happy to hear that one. Yeah. Awesome. And it's, it's one of the things that separates us from a lot of other people. And it's, it's sorely lacking in the law enforcement and military communities, sadly. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Do you want to do all your plugs again and then, uh, we'll close it up. Sure. So if, uh, you'd like to get some more information or hear uh, more of the content that we have available, um, our newest thing that we are doing or that I guess I'm doing is I have a weekly podcast comes out on Thursday morning, uh, and it's called protection dog podcast. Uh, currently has a picture of Ratchet sitting there looking all regal uh, as the image on it. And um, and we do kind of a deep dive into a lot of these different topics, uh, talk about stability, talk about uh, some of our philosophy of our training. Uh, we get into things like uh, why is anger an issue for dog trainers and handlers, uh, lots of different topics like that. And, um, and we encourage people that if you have a topic you want us to do a deep dive into, 
uh, let us know. Each one's between 30 and 36 minutes, I think, is our longest one. So they're not terribly long, but a good uh, listen while you're driving to work. We also have um, YouTube channels for both Canine Academy Online and Fortress Canine. Um, I'm trying to get more consistent on those uh, but we have a uh, decent amount of videos up on that already. And then, of course, the thing we're most active on is Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and on Facebook, I am at Fortress Canine Dogs. And on Instagram, I'm at Fortress Canine. Uh, and then I'm at Canine Academy Online on both of those platforms. And if you want to get your puppy porn on, we have now recently started Fortress Canine. K, uh, what is it at fortress canine dot puppies and uh, so i have a puppy trainer now that runs that for me and all of those are pictures of our puppies doing all sorts of really cute things and uh, playing with her really large german shepherd male that's not one of our dogs but is it this like really great dog with the puppies um so those are things that they can do to get in touch with me and then of course they can always uh email me at joel at fortress canine dot com fantastic i don't have a ton of housekeeping uh, I got the book coming out. Hopefully, within 60 days, I expect it to be published if everything stays on track. Uh, maybe. You better send me a link so I can I know, buy it man. as soon as it's available. I would love to. Uh, and that's it. I'm really thankful for the Patreon subscribers that make these episodes continue to happen. And uh, we will hopefully see you folks on the next one.